Well, we started talking about the 12 Olympians. There's a question mark because there's a number of different lists of the Olympians. On some lists, Hades does show up, okay. Um, but th this is just kind of a consensus list. This is posted on Canvas for you. I asked you to uh, begin the process of uh, memorizing these things, remembering them. I'll try to prompt you a little bit today and a whole lot more next week um, so that you start to learn these. And then uh, make it a long-term memory project because we're going to be referring to these gods for the rest of the semester. And if you're going to take a semester of your life learning about Greek mythology, you might as well remember the gods, at least the names of the gods and what they do for the rest of your life, okay? Uh, or else, you know, in four weeks I'll be telling a story about Aphrodite and you won't know who she is and what's going on, so it just kind of makes sense, all right? Uh, and then um, I just very quickly talked about Zeus and Hera because very quickly um, we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about Zeus and Hera, so you're going to pick up on all their characteristics and so on. There's Zeus. The Romans called him Jupiter, the god of the sky, lightning, justice. You see Zeus there. I gave you this little... It's not really a chart, is it? But just something to look at while I talked about this process of this very rapid adoption of the Greek gods by the Romans because they're, they're at a stage in their religious development where they have animistic gods and these much more exciting, more interesting anthropomorphic gods just flood in and fill in the, the, the narrative gap, okay, the need for the story there. We took uh, a, a few minutes. I talked about Hera. Here you see Hera in her chariot being pulled by peacocks, accompanied by, obviously, Mercury. The Greeks called him Hermes, the Romans called him Mercury. Whoever said that wasn't Mercury was <laughs> obviously, oh, that was me, wasn't it? Yeah. I'll explain why when we get to it, okay? It wasn't until I got a closer look. I didn't have my glasses. I couldn't see the wings on the, we'll get to the wings on the hat, okay? But um, the people who said it was Mercury were right and I was wrong. Um, I'll explain why when we get to it. Maybe that'll help you remember what the, 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 the point was, okay. Uh, and gave you the similar, it's not really a chart, is it, but to, to, just, to get, just to get Hera from, from a Greek god to being a, a Roman god. Now for new stuff for today. We're going to start off with uh, Zeus and Hera's legitimate children, the legi legitimate children that Zeus has that... Um, well, you'll see what I mean. At least they, they arrive during the time in which Zeus and Hera are married to each other. We'll start with Ares. The Romans called him Mars. I give you God of Bad Wars as a way of just quickly summarizing what Ares is about. He's really the God of the bad stuff that happens in wars, but that's a little bit long. Um, that when you think about wars, the atrocities, the bloodlust, the... Um, mindless violence, needless violence. Um, that's what I'm talking about when I talk about bad wars, all right? Um, he's, he's the god of bad wars. You see him with his symbol there, the shield. Ares, you're going to find out an awful lot about. I'll tell you one story about him today. Um, he's, he's, he's the least popular of all the gods among the other gods. Very few of the other gods get along with him. Aphrodite gets along with him way too well, which will be talking about, but she gets along with everybody. Um, he's notorious for switching sides in the middle of wars, um, not a very reliable god. He's the closest to a chaotic or just m recklessly evil god among the Olympians. I mean, at least most some of the other gods, you know, are evil sometimes and good sometimes. Ari is just pretty much across the board an evil kind of guy. Um, he has some, some children who follow him around. His children are Eris. You don't have to, to worry about getting these names down. Eris, the, who's the god of strife, and Phobos. Phobos literally means fear, um, pain, and panic, and famine. These are kind of animistic spirits that follow. They follow, follow Ares around. Um, fear and panic. Overall, not a very good guy. He's a crybaby. Um, Zeus 
nails him up in a barrel one time. He can't put up with his whining, so he just nails him up in a barrel. Anyway, he's not, he's not one of my favorites. Okay. Uh, Zeus and Hera have two daughters who are not all that significant in the myths. There's Alethea. I just give you her name there. She's the goddess of childbirth. She shows up in an awful lot of myths, but she's kind of like a, like a side character because in an awful lot of myths, babies are born, and you have to have the goddess of childbirth somehow around when a baby's born, and so she'll show up and then leave, but as far as much of a story, there's not much going on there. And so she's not considered one of the Olympians. She's one of Zeus and Hera's daughters, but she doesn't fit into that, that category of being an Olympian. And much the same is true of the next of Zeus and Hera's daughter, daughters, um, Hebe, the goddess of youthful beauty. She's the cupbearer for the gods for a while until she messes up. She doesn't keep that job very long. It doesn't take too much work to work through that part of the myth, right? Youthful beauty doesn't last very long. That's the idea there. The next two are kind of interesting because the way that you tell the story determines which one was born first. Um, it's an interesting kind of problem to run into. But the third child, who's at least born during the time that Zeus and Hera are married, is Athena. The Romans called her Minerva. She's the goddess of wisdom. I say good wars there. What I mean are the good things about wars, like putting together a good strategy and good tactics, um, wisdom in knowing which way to pursue the enemy, that kind of thing. The, uh, the honor and valor that come out of, out of war and that kind of thing. Uh, and the god of cities, the god of city, lives, city life. Athena is the daughter of Zeus and a woman he was messing around with, uh, one of the titans, a woman named Metis. That's M-E-T-I-S. Just so you know what I'm saying. She's actually Zeus's aunt. If Zeus is the son of Cronus and Medes is one of the Titans, that means she's uh, his aunt. But like I said, it's a very narrow, very shallow gene pool. Um, uh, Medes gets pregnant. And uh, Zeus hears a prophecy that Medes will give birth to a daughter and also give birth to a son who will be greater than the father. We ran into that same line last time we were together, only in a completely different story, because this fear of having a son who's greater than the father is a big problem for Zeus. Well, Zeus doesn't know quite what to do about the situation, but he comes up with a plan of some sorts. He, um, he, he turns Metis into a fly, and then catches Metis and swallows her. So they say. Well, Metis is out of the picture, you would think. But uh, Metis flies around inside Zeus, goes up to Zeus's head, where she kind of settles in, and she begins making a suit of armor and a helmet. Out of magic, because she's a titan, she makes fire, she makes bronze, she brings the bronze in, she melts it on the fire, she smelts the, the bronze, um, she begins making the suit of armor. All of this is going on inside, uh, inside Zeus's head. Zeus gets this huge migraine headache, okay. He's, he's in incredible pain. And finally, Zeus comes up with a, a, a plan. He, he's going to take an ax and chop his head open and let the pain out. Well, I've never had bronze melted in my head, okay. Apparently, it takes away the part of your brain that has good ideas or something. I don't know. But... Um, uh, he gets an idea. He tells one of his son, Hephaestus, we'll get to him today, who's the armor maker and the, 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 the blacksmith for the gods, to, to make an axe. And then uh, somebody volunteers to chop up uh, Zeus's, chop open Zeus's head. Guess who? Prometheus. You remember Prometheus? Prometheus and Zeus don't really get along all that well. Um, uh, Prometheus cuts into Zeus's head, and out of Zeus's head jumps Athena. Fully grown, you can imagine where the headache came from. She's fully grown with all that armor on, and she stands there, and um, now she's arrived. 
Well, that's where Athena comes from. She's the goddess of wisdom and good wars and cities. It's kind of interesting. Athena gets given a nickname by every different city, which kind of connects her to that city. Uh, her name is Athena. Of course, she's the patron goddess of Athens. In Thebes, there's a palace built to her, and everybody on the street calls her Theba because she's connected to the city. In Mycenae, they call her Mycana because she's somehow connected to the city. Um, and you'll see her involved in these kind of areas as we go through some of these myths. She also collects a lot of things that there's really no purpose for. She keeps them in her closet. Every once in a while, you'll hear about Minerva's closet. A reference to Minerva's closet is just a collection of all kinds of stuff. And as she travels around, she collects stuff. And every once in a while, she has to go in the closet and find something to make use of. Hephaestus is the next of the Olympians to talk about here. The Romans called him Vulcan. The god of fire and forge is the traditional title that's given to Hephaestus. What happens is that uh, after Athena is born, Hera gets jealous. She gets jealous not only because Zeus has had a child with Metis, but um, he's also given ch birth to that child all by himself. Out of his head pops Athena. And so she decides she's going to one-up Zeus, so she conceives Hephaestus by herself. It doesn't happen all that often, but it happens sometimes in the stories, especially with the earth goddesses. Remember all the way back to the first day of class, the earth goddesses and, and fertility and Gaia. Well, um, Hera is Gaia's granddaughter, you know. So I say, why not? Why not? That's all I have to say about it. Why not? If she's an earth goddess, she can conceive for her by herself. Why not? She conceives Hephaestus. Anyway, Hephaestus is born. He's an ugly baby. He's unusually small. One story says he was born with a club foot and would never be able to walk. Um, and in that story, Hera is terribly disappointed that she's given birth to this ugly little baby who's never going to be able to walk. So she throws him off of Mount Olympus. It takes a day for him to fall and hurt, hit the ground in the story. That's how tall Mount Olympus is. In another story, uh, Hephaestus is, is, a, is born. He's an ugly little baby. Uh, but he's just fine. But one day Zeus and Hera get in a big fight. And uh, Zeus is getting ready to punch Hera. And Hephaestus jumps in the way uh, to stop his father from hitting his mother. And uh, it works. He doesn't hit Hera. Zeus doesn't hit Hera. But Zeus takes Hephaestus and throws him off the mountain. It takes a day for him to land. And when he lands, he breaks both of his legs so horribly that he'll never walk again. One story or the other uh, he's, he is handicapped. He's not going to be able to walk. Um, anyway, he becomes the god of fire and forge. He becomes the blacksmith and the armorer. He's always making cool stuff. He makes two robots to help him in his, in his blacksmith shop. He makes the robots out of gold with silver tongues, and they move around and help him in the shop. He makes a, a chair that moves around wherever he wants it to go so he can just sit in his chair and, and do his work kind of neat inventions. Every time the gods need something cool made, they go to Hephaestus, you see. They ask him to make cool stuff for him. Everyone likes him. His best friends are the Cyclops. They hang out down around the vol volcanoes, and they make all, all kinds of cool stuff. It's kind of interesting that um, in making bronze, many blacksmiths used, in the, in, the bron in the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, used arsenic to harden the metal. And one of the conditions of being around arsenic is to develop a lameness. It develops a nervous problem, and then people have a difficult time walking around. So there may be some connection between this arsenic poisoning, which is happening to an awful lot of blacksmiths, because we see um, lame, handicapped blacksmiths uh, all over the place in Norse theology, in uh, Ugaritic uh, mythology that's in the, in the area of Mesopotamia. In India, there's a myth about a blacksmith who is who is crippled and unable to walk. Um, kind of interesting. Hephaestus is an outcast. I mean, literally, he's cast out of, um, out of Mount Olympus. But in an honor-based society, you're going to be hearing me say more about this as we go through the semester, he's, uh, um, an honor-based society is where your self-image comes from what other people think about you. Other people give you your, your self-identity. And in an honor-based society, to be, to be ugly, 
to be shorter than average, to be a handicapped in any way, to be working class for that matter, blacksmiths are working class, is, is not to fit in with the aristocracy. It's not to fit in with the, the good people in society. And so if Feistus, he's a, an outcast, literally being thrown off the mountain, but he also uh, doesn't fit in. But um, everybody likes him. I mean, he doesn't have very many enemies. Um, you see him there with his hammer. That's the symbol of Hephaestus, his hammer there. And yes, he's an Olympian. Hephaestus is married to another Olympian, so we'll talk about her. We finished up talking about Zeus and Hera's legitimate children. Hephaestus is married to Aphrodite. Aphrodite is Zeus's sister, so Hephaestus is married to his aunt Aphrodite. The Romans called her Venus. You see there she's the goddess of beauty and desire and love. I tried to find an image where you could see the dove. That's one of the symbols I gave you of Aphrodite. You may be able to see there's a dove right here. Well, you can't see that now. Can you start to see the dove? Maybe a little bit. It's right there. I just couldn't find a good image to show you. You may be able to make out here that she's sitting in a seashell. Can you make the ocean? Can you make out the ocean waves down here? Remember how uh, Aphrodite is born from Uranus's castrated testicles when they hit the water. The sea foam spins around and out comes Aphrodite and apparently floats to the shore on a seashell here. That's what that reference is going on there. Well, anyway, Hephaestus and Aphrodite are married to each other. The goddess of beauty and love and desire, she marries this working class guy who's an outcast from society. He smells like smoke and he's lame and he's short and he's ugly. Working class guy and he hangs out with Cyclops. He ends up married to the goddess of beauty and love. It's said that Zeus did this to Aphrodite to teach her a lesson, to punish her because she's always making people and gods fall in love with each other and acting like idiots. Don't people act like idiots when they fall in love? That's how you know you fell in love because you act like idiots and then later when you think back you think, why the heck did I do that? And it's like, oh yeah, I was in love. Yeah. So anyway, Zeus says, I'll fix you. I'll marry you to the Danny DeVito of gods. Short and ugly and, yeah, I'll fix you. Uh, but the thing is, if Hystus is such a nice guy, I mean, he's just not very handsome, but he's a nice guy. Anyway, one day, well, if Hystus is off on a business trip, Aphrodite um, looking for a little love on the side, which I guess is okay. I mean, she's the goddess of beauty and desire and so on. Um, so she decides to go over to the house of Ares, the god of war. We talked about Ares a minute ago. Of course, he's the god of war, so he's a very studly god, you know. Um, of course, he's also a jerk. He's a crybaby. Or oh, at that time, he got nailed in a barrel. He was, he was wounded in the Trojan War and came back to Olympus to whine about it, and Zeus just grabbed him, put him in a barrel, nailed it shut until he was quiet. So he's the kind of guy you think of who does this sort of thing. Anyway... Ares and Aphrodite, they um, have a little hanky-panky. They get caught in flagrante delicto. Do you know what, that, know what that means? It's Latin. Literally means in blazing crime. They get caught in the blazing crime. That's Latin for doing the wild thing. Okay. But if you say in flagrante delicto, um, it sounds dignified and polite company. I mean, how anthropomorphic can these deities get, you know? Well, anyway, um, they're getting some hanky-panky in the El Sacco, and, and somebody comes by, Helios. Who remembers who Helios is? Sam. The god of the sun, right. Helios comes by, the sun. The sun sees everything, right? The sun looks down and sees, well, almost everything. The sun comes over, looks down, and there's Aphrodite and Ares in flagrante delicto. Like I said, how anthropomorphic can these gods get? Maybe you've been in this situation. Somebody's messing around with somebody else, and 
do you tell their boyfriend or girlfriend or do you leave it alone or what do you do? I mean, what a mess. Well, Helios finally goes to Hephaestus. Like I say, everybody likes Hephaestus and says, look, uh, you know, I hate to be the one to tell you, but I'm the sun god. I see everything. And Aphrodite and Ares, they got this thing going on. Um, um, but Hephaestus is not happy to hear this. So Hephaestus goes down to his metal shop and he makes this chain net, uh, chain link net out of that adamantine stuff, that really hard metal stuff. And he makes it so fine, he spins out the metal so fine you can't even see it. It's like this invisible net of unbreakable metal. And um, the next time Aphrodite goes over to Ari's house for a little loving, um, Hephaestus sneaks up on them, and he throws this invisible net over them. They can't get away, and he catches them. He drags them all the way to Mount Olympus, and he, he puts them there in the middle of Mount Olympus, and he calls out to all the gods and goddesses to come see what's going on. The gods show up. The goddesses don't show up. I guess it's a guy thing. The gods show up, and they stand around uh, making fun of them, <coughs> laughing at them. Apollo says, uh, hey, Vice, just let me in that net. Let me get at her. And uh, 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 Hermes says, uh, uh, having a little erectile dysfunction there, Ares, all of a sudden, are you? And everybody's making fun of him. That's the opposite of honor, you see, is shame. Having people stand around and make fun, throw tomatoes, all that kind of stuff. That's the opposite. And in an honor-based society, shame is something you want to avoid. Um, well, finally, everybody's laughing at them, making fun of them. They're trying to get out of the net. They're ashamed and embarrassed and caught and all of that. And finally, Poseidon uh, says, uh, look, just let them go. And if it happens again, I'll, I'll kill uh, Ares. And so Hephaestus undoes the net, lets them go. Aphrodite and Ares conceive a child at that point. That's um, uh, Phobos, fear. It's kind of interesting. The child who's born is fear. There's a later ideological addition to the story. The later part of the story is that uh, Ares had stationed a soldier outside of his house, and he was supposed to, to holler if anybody came by. But um, this guard is just standing there, and here comes the sun, and he's not paying much attention. The sun goes right overhead. And, of course, Helios, the sun god, looks down and uh-oh, sees what's going on. And so Ares gets really mad and uh, turns this soldier into a rooster. See, that's why roosters crow when the sun comes up. They learned their lesson, and now the rooster crows when the sun comes up because he's learned his lesson. Well, Aphrodite is Zeus's sister and daughter-in-law, the wife of Hephaestus. Zeus and Aphrodite have a brother, Poseidon. The Romans called him Neptune. He's the god of sea and earthquakes. Homer calls him the earth thrower. And there you see his symbol, the trident, that three-pointed spear that he's got there. Sea gods are interesting and as examples of this move from animistic to anthropomorphic visions of the gods. I've got uh, the three generations of the major sea gods on the screen there. <coughs> Excuse me, there's Pontus, who's created by Gaia, or, or just kind of arises out of Gaia. There's Oceanus, the second generation, who's a titan. Both of these are um, animistic gods. Pontus means sea, and Oceanus means ocean. Again, it's like clock, right? Ocean. The god is ocean. There's not very many stories about Pontus and Oceanus, um, but then Poseidon, the third generation, the Olympian generation, is full bore anthropomorphic. I mean, everything bad about human beings shows up with um, Poseidon. And Poseidon's a very powerful god. We learned that recently, right? Water's pretty powerful. I had a neighbor whose truck got washed away and um, all kinds of damage done by the flooding. Um, 
You've probably seen the surf come up during high tide and white take away all the sand castles and stuff and leave the, leave the sand all nice and smooth, destroying roads or uh, whatever. Well, water is very powerful. Have you ever tried to follow a drop of water like down a windshield? It goes this way and that way. So it's kind of, tr water is kind of tricky, kind of devious. It's always twisting and turning. And uh, sea gods tend to be like that. And they tend to be very big and powerful because there's a lot of water. How much of the Earth's surface is covered by water? I forget. 75%? That's a lot. There's a lot of water around here. So that makes it very powerful. So the sea gods, you see, they had to be very studly, and the sea goddesses had to be very fertile because there's an awful lot of water out there for them to, to populate. Oceanus, that second generation Titan, has like millions and millions and millions of kids with his wife, Tethys. Uh, um, but they're animistic, okay? And no one thinks that's a problem. No one suggests they might want to slow things down a bit. Nobody wonders how they're going to care for all these kids. Um, nobody even asks these kind of questions because there's so much water, you've got to have all this, these kids to, to fill it. By the third generation, these sea gods kind of slow down. There's one uh, sea god in that third generation, uh, Doris, come from the same place at Pandora. And Doris means the gifted one. Uh, she only has 50 kids, uh, which is still an awful lot, but, um, well, because there's an awful lot of power. Uh, when we're talking about animistic gods at the start of, of time, they're like pushing out kids all over the place. By the third generation, it kind of slows down. And because it's anthropomorphic, you have more gods to make up stories about. You don't hold Oceanus to, you know, responsible parenting. But Poseidon, you know, you're kind of concerned about where the kids are going to come up. So you got the sea gods who are notoriously studly and the sea goddesses who are notoriously fertile. And... Uh, Poseidon has the same approach to marriage that Zeus does, which is not much of one. He marries one of the sea goddesses, whoops, Amphrotiti. Um, she develops kind of a nasty personality from being cheating, cheated on all the time. Can't say I blame her all that much, really, when you think about it. But you have to understand there's more than just the moral point going on here. If you're going to have sea gods, you have to have... Um, all kinds of procreation. You have to have all kinds of children because you have all kinds of water to fill up with the gods. And being married to Poseidon isn't much of a picnic because um, most of his gods are kind of weird. You have to picture Poseidon sitting in his office with pictures of his kids on the wall around him and on his desk. Uh, there's no picture of Amphrodite because he's not really all that into being married. He's got only one legitimate son by Amphrodite. That's his son, Triton. Triton, um, we would call a merman. He's half fish and half man, the fish being the bottom part. He has a big horn that he blows to announce the coming of Poseidon. If you see very many fountains around the world, he's a big figure in fountains. Another child of Poseidon's, he's very proud of, is Arion. Arion is a horse. Where Arion comes from is kind of interesting. One day Poseidon gets the hots for his sister, Demeter. Like I said, there's a lot of shallow gene pool stuff going on here. Um, Demeter is out in the field one day and she's, Demeter, we'll get to her in a minute, is the grain god, the goddess of fertility. And so she's out in the field checking on flowers and plants and that kind of stuff when uh, she sees Poseidon walking towards her and she gets kind of a creepy feeling. And she turns herself into a mare, a, a, a horse, and gallops away as fast as she can. Well, Poseidon gallops, uh, and turns himself into a stallion and gallops after her as, as far as he can. And then he catches her, and the child who's conceived there is Arion. And because his mother and father were horses when they were conceived, then he has to be a horse. See how weird this is? It's also kind of disgusting. We'll be talking about that at the start of class on... Uh, on Monday of next week. The Aryan's kind of weird. He thought Aryan was weird. Pegasus is a horse, too, but he's a horse who can fly. You don't even want to know where he, how he was born. He was born out of the severed neck of his mother after Perseus cut her head off. I told you you didn't want to know. You just didn't want to know. But Perseus is there. 
Charybdis is the whirlpool, a huge whirlpool in the ocean. She sucks in all the water she can, and that's what makes the low tide, and then she spits it all back out into the ocean, and that's what makes the high tide. So you got this big, scary sea monster out in the ocean who makes the high tide and the low tide. Pull, sucks in the water and spits it back out. Scientists tell me the moon does that. Whatever. The moon. The moon pulls water up in the air. Right. I think the scientists are at the animistic stage. Next thing you know, they're going to be talking about Moonzilla and all this kind of stuff, how, he, how she pulls up water from the earth. That's what they say anyway. Anyway, all this is pretty strange. But it's not really all that strange when you think about it. Um, the ancient world, they look at the sea. It's huge. It's got to have lots of gods in it. It's very powerful. These gods have to be very powerful. And there had to be a lot of them to give them all this power. And then um, if you're going to have a promiscuous god with lots of weird kids, he has to be a sea god. Because sea gods had to be promiscuous, they had to have lots of children, they had to have lots of offspring, and uh, who's going to be the father of all these sea gods and sea monsters and sea creatures and weird things that wash up on the beach and all this kind of stuff? Um, if you're going to believe a particular sea monster has a parent, then that parent has to be a sea god of some kind. And so it's typical of sea gods to have uh, weird children because you have all these weird sea monsters, scary things that live in the ocean. And, of course, he's one of the Olympians. <clears throat> he, Zeus and Aphrodite and Poseidon's sister Demeter, the Romans called her Ceres. She's the goddess of agriculture, fertility, and the seasons. You see her there with her symbol, the cornucopia, a goat's horn with... Uh, all kind of food that comes out of it. You see some grapes coming out of that, go of that goat's horn there. Um, you remember the horse story I just told you. That's the story about Demeter. You also remember a story I just gave you, the, the rough outline of the, well, I think the first day of class, maybe the second day of class, about Demeter's daughter Persephone and where the seasons come from. You remember who kidnapped her in his chariot? Hades, that's right. Hades comes by, kidnaps her. We'll catch up to that story, give a little bit more detail. That'll be in uh, two weeks, I think. Demeter's usually pretty nice, unless you mess with her trees. Don't mess with her trees. Otherwise, she's pretty nice, but don't mess with her trees. Man, don't mess with her trees. Whatever you do, don't mess with her trees. She's usually pretty nice. She's sad and distracted when Persephone is away. She's got another son. I've got, I should have put Persephone's name up there. She's got another son, Plutus. Plutus is the god of wealth. Wealth comes from agriculture and fertility. See how it works? Plutus, not Pluto. That's somebody else. We'll talk about Pluto. Yeah, another name for Hades. Plutus is uh, the god of wealth. He's also blind. That makes sense because some people are wealthy who shouldn't have money and some people aren't wealthy who deserve to have money. And so now we know why, because the god of wealth is blind. You may have heard of a plutocracy. A plutocracy means the rule of the wealthy, where the wealthy run society. There's one more sister in that group, Zeus, Poseidon, Hera, Demeter, and that's Hestia. The Romans called her Vespa. She's the goddess of hearth. That's the traditional title, but nobody has hearths anymore in their house, or very few people, and those who do don't care much about it. That's the, the spot where you cook over the fireplace. Uh, I put home life there as a way to connect to 21st century Americans, maybe. The goddess of the home life. Um, she's boring. All she does is stay home. Um, she never has any boyfriends, never gets married, doesn't have any children. She never picks side in a war. She never changes anybody into anything. Um, they're just kind of boring. Yeah, she likes it, but she's a homebody. I mean, that's just her. And that's about all you can say. Not terribly exciting. Now for Zeus's illegitimate children. 
who make it into the Olympians. Trust me, there's a whole lot more. We're just talking about the ones who make it into the Olympians. Um, it's in the wrong place. We're going to be talking about Apollo and Artemis. Okay. Apollo and Artemis are children of Zeus with a goddess named Leto. Leto is one of his cousins. She's the daughter of one of the Titans. Zeus was involved with her too before he married Hera, but he uh, keeps seeing her after he's married to Hera. So Hera, of course, is jealous. She finds out that Leto is pregnant by Zeus. And so she curses Leto and says, uh, you can't rest on any land. And of course, you can't rest on water. Why? I don't know. But you can't rest on land. And Hera even sends a dragon named Python to chase her around. We'll catch up to Python later in the semester. Finally, Leto for finds an island that's just been newly formed. And it hasn't stuck to the bottom of the water yet. And so it's floating around. And so that counts as, as not land. And so Hera's curse doesn't um, apply there. So she's able to make it to land where she's able to finally take a nap. Zeus is doing nothing to help her. Um, you're going to get used to that. That's the way Zeus does things. That's the way he rolls. But what does Leto say? Oh, this time he'll be different. I've changed him. He loves me. This time he'll do things different. Have you heard that one before? Don't be that person. Don't be that woman. Don't be that man. Don't be that guy. Don't be that woman. Anyway, finally she can take a nap, which is a good thing because she goes into labor for nine days which is an awful long time to go into labor for. Why is she in labor for nine days? Well, Hera's daughter, Aletheia, is the goddess of childbirth. And Hera won't let Aletheia go and let Leto give birth to her twins. And um, finally the gods start to feel sorry for Leto, so they bribe Hera with a, uh, a, a huge necklace. Uh, if she'll let Aletheia come and, and deliver Leto's children. So Aletheia shows up. Apollo is born first. The Romans called him Apollo too, so that's easy. He's the god of light and prophecy and reason. I put the sun up there, and you can go ahead and jot that down. I'll say some more things about that in a minute, because your first thought is we already have a sun god, right? But I'll have some thoughts about that in a second. He's also the, heal the god of healing and archery and music and song and poetry and boy children. All these gods multitask, okay? They're all in charge of, of different things. But I've only put down the big ones for you to learn. And then his sister Artemis is born next. The Romans called her Diana. And as you see on the screen, she's the scene of the goddess of animals and hunting and virginity. She's associated with the moon. And she takes care of girl children. Her, uh, one of her symbols is the bow and arrow. You see, yeah, you can make out the arrows there in her quiver. Now I put the moon up here for Artemis and the sun up there for Apollo. Now you know the Greeks already have a sun god. Who's the Greek sun god? Helios. There's also Hyperion, the animistic god that Helios kind of moves in and replace. Um, and the, Roman, uh, the Greeks had a goddess of the moon as well. Um, but the Romans are the ones who adopt uh, these stories, the story of Artemis, the story of Apollo, and ap apply Apollo to being the anthropomorphic sun god and Artemis to being the anthropomorphic moon god. So the Romans think of Artemis as the moon god, the Greeks not so much, they already got one. And the same for Apollo. Uh, the Greeks already have Helios, they don't need another sun god. Um, but the Romans don't have one and so they kind of adopt the Apollo stories and apply them to the sun. Artemis is born with um, black hair and very fair skin. Apollo is born with uh, blonde hair and very well-tanned skin. Um, Artemis has a bow that shoots silver arrows that put people to sleep before they die. Um, Apollo has golden arrows that burn people before they die. So there's 
plenty in the myth to connect Apollo to the moon and Artemis to the, or Apollo to the sun and Artemis to the moon for um, the Romans to make use of. Apollo, um, some general characteristics, he's unlucky in love. He'll have all kinds of children, but he never gets married, um, never has any kind of stable relationship. Um, with men, it just doesn't ever work out either. With trees, you know, just don't ask. It doesn't work out with trees. I told you, don't ask. Artemis, Artemis never gets married. She never has a boyfriend, uh, never falls in love, doesn't have any children. Uh, but she's really, really interesting. She's not like her Aunt Vespa. She's uh, an interesting one. The next illegitimate son of Zeus is Hermes. The Romans called him Mercury. Merc's in Latin is the, is the Latin word for uh, merchandise. You see there that Hermes is the god of commerce, one of his responsibilities, the god of communication, and the god of thieves, and a whole lot more. His mother is the goddess Maya. I'll spell that out for you just so you can get it down. It's M-A-I-A. The second day after he's born, he climbs out of his crib and he heads out into the world to find out uh, what's out there. He goes to where Apollo's uh, keeping his cattle, and he steals Apollo's cattle. He, he goes at night. Actually, he, he slips out of, the, out of the cave while his mother's asleep, and he goes out and um, he finds where the cattle are. He ties tree branches to the back of his feet so that he'll, he'll erase the the footsteps in the sand that he leaves when he walks, and he uh, somehow convinces the cows to walk backwards out of the place where they are, so their footprints will look like they walked in, so this will confuse Apollo. Uh, Hermes takes the, uh, the cattle to a, to, a, to a place near to where the cave is. He takes two of the cows and uh, sacrifices them to the Olympians. He adds himself in there as one of the Olympians, which is pretty bold. And uh, from those cows that he sacrifices, he grabs some of the intestines and he takes them home. And as he takes them home, he dries them. He finds a tor tortoise shell on his way home and he wraps the dried intestines around the tortoise shell and invents the guitar. Or a lyre. That's spelled L-Y-R-E. The lyre. Like a guitar. He teaches himself how to play the guitar. Um, well, he gets home. His mother is all upset because her... Her newborn baby is out of the crib, and he comes walking in, and, and she gets upset, but he plays her beautiful music on his lyre until uh, she's happy, and then she falls asleep. Um, but then Apollo comes storming in. One of Apollo's gifts is prophecy. You'll pick up on that pretty quickly. And Ap Apollo knows who's taken his cattle. He doesn't quite know where they are, but he knows he's, who's done it, so he shows up, um, very angry, and Hermes plays a little baby thing. He lays there in the crib, goo goo ga ga goo goo ga ga, and Apollo isn't buying it. He grabs a hold of him, takes him to Mount Olympus, and stands him before Zeus. and And Apollo says, uh, "Dad, tell him to sh tell me where the cattle are." And uh, Zeus tells um, uh, Hermes, hey, "Yeah, you know, your big brother had the cattle. You need to give it back to him." And Hermes says. Um, well, I can't because I already sacrificed two of them. Well, now Apollo's just furious. He's really upset. Um, but then Hermes takes out the lyre, and he plays beautiful music on it. And Apollo decides, well, if you give me your lyre and teach me how to play it, then, um, then, then, you, then you can keep the cattle. And so Hermes teaches Apollo how to play the lyre, and Apollo becomes really good at it. The fact that Apollo plays the lyre shows up in a number of, of stories, and we'll get to some of those next week. On the screen, you see Apollo there. Uh, sorry, Hermes there. Apollo gives him the staff that you're seeing there, the caduceus, the, uh, there we go, the, uh, which looks like that, the staff with two snakes wrapped around it there, and the wings there. That's what the um, heralds, carried. Heralds are, that's H-E-R-A-L-D-S, are those who carry messages back and forth between, between generals in a war 
like between the enemy and the good guy general. They send heralds back and forth carrying messages. And so as part of the rules of war, you can't, um, you can't kill a herald because that's how they send messages back and forth between each other. And so carrying that staff marked one as a, as a messenger. Hermes is the messenger of the gods. Uh, when you look at it, what do you associate that symbol with? Health and medicine, nursing. That's a historic error in the United States um, that developed in the late 19th century to use Hermes Caduceus as a symbol. What they're really thinking of is, uh, what they were looking for was the rod of Asclepius. That was a healing rod in um, uh, Greek mythology with only one snake wrapped around it. If you're familiar with the Moses stories that come out of Exodus, there's another story about healing that comes from a bronze snake around a, a pole. Um, maybe some connection between the two stories. Anyway, there are all kinds of, uh, of different staffs that refer to different things with snakes wrapped around them, which is, well, we won't get to that in a minute. Um, Zeus honors Hermes as messenger by giving him special sandals with wings on them. And uh, sometimes it's portrayed as a hat with wings on them. It kind of makes sense here to see them with both. He has to have wings on his hat or his feet because he runs really fast to carry messages. But if he only had wings on his feet, he'd do somersaults all the time. And if he only had wings on his hat, he'd fall on his face all the time. So it kind of makes sense to have them both. Over to the right, you see the tortoise shell with the, um, the, the lyre that he invents there. This is what threw me with the picture here. I was asked who this figure is, and I said I didn't know, took a quick look. Of course, you see the staff here with the two snakes here, which is why I said I knew why people had suggested Hermes. But I didn't see the wings that go with the typical caduceus, so I wasn't sure because there are so many of these staffs with snakes. And I didn't see winged sandals down here, and because I didn't have my glasses, I didn't see wings here. Is that a wing? It kind of looks like a wing. It might be a ponytail, um, but if you saw that and the caduceus, then, then, then that's, that's why we, saw, we thought Mercury. Um, that might be wings there. I'm not, still not quite sure. But anyway, that's, that's what had confused me in our, uh, in our class on, um, on Monday. There's one more in that list to talk about, one more illegitimate son of Zeus. That's Dionysus. The Romans called him Bacchus. He's the god of wine and ecstasy. But ecstasy in this case means something different than the way we usually use the word today. In this case, ecstasy means madness, insanity. He's the god of wine and, and madness, insanity, ecstasy. Ecstasy for the Greek mind was uh, excited insanity, um, hyperactive insanity. Um, Dionysus is the um, modern definition of a psychopath, I think. At one point in his life, he is mentally ill. He's healed and then just becomes incredibly violent, even though he's not himself insane. Um, anyway, he's the only half-human Olympian on that list that I gave you. Other lists would include Hercules, who's also half-human. Um, but on that list I gave you, he's the only half-human Olympian. When he's born, Zeus sends Hermes to take him far away so Hera can't get mad at him. Hermes takes Dionysus to where Turkey is today. Dionysus is a, a god who's influenced by living in, the, in the, what you, we would call the Near East. Um, he grew up around tigers and lions and wild grapes. At one point, he learns how to ferment grape juice and to make wine out of it. And so he begins traveling around um, teaching people how to make wine. And as he does so, he keeps announcing that he's a son of Zeus. Where Hera finds out about this guy who's going around um, claiming that he's a son of Zeus, so Hera becomes jealous. She um, ascends insanity on Dionysus. Dionysus spends quite a bit of time out of his mind, insane. 
Um, but he's told to go to a temple where he can be healed. He goes to that temple. He is healed technically, but he maintains this, his violence. Uh, now he's just a psychopath. He, he was schizophrenic, but now he's just a, a psychopath. He starts killing people to get Zeus's attention in all kinds of horrible ways, and we'll hear about some of them. At one point, some pirates kidnap him to sell him on the slave market. Um, he tells them that he's one of the sons, that he's a son of Zeus, and they don't believe him. Well, one, one sailor believes him. So he, um, he breaks his ropes, and he goes ballistic. All the sailors jump overboard. Dionysus turns them into dolphins, which is about the most merciful thing Dionysus ever does to anybody. Um, well, Dionysus, he's the god of wine and ecstasy. We're going to be finding out a lot more about him. There's a whole cult that develops around him that we'll be talking about in two weeks. And now some concluding thoughts on this idea of the cult of the Twelve. <coughs> Excuse me. First of all, this, world, this word cult gets used in a lot of different contexts. In a sociology class, you'll use it in one context. It means all kinds of different things. Here's how we're going to be using this word cult in this course. As a group of people who are within a broader tradition who have a specific way of worshiping, specific ways of beliefs, and specific beliefs and rituals. So there's a cult of Dionysus. There's a cult of the Twelve. Um, the cult of Dionysus, for example, everything is directed towards Dionysus. But if you met someone who says, I'm a member of the cult of Dionysus, and you said, oh, that means you don't worship Zeus, they would say, well, of course we worship Zeus. Um, they fit within the broader Greek religious tradition, but you have a special subsystem of special religious beliefs and, and rituals. And that's what we mean when we talk about the cult of the Twelve. On Mount Olympus, there are 12 thrones. The big question is who sits on them, which is why there are lots of different lists. I gave you the big, the big 13. How do you get from 13 on that list to 12? Um, the most popular story is that Aunt Vespa um, just got tired of all the wars and all the fighting. She's the god of the, the hearth and home, right? And, and she's that one who's really kind of boring. And she just gave up her throne and said, you guys mess with it. I'm just going to go back home. And, um, and Dionysus takes over so he'll stop killing people. That's a common story. Um, but that there are 12 thrones on Olympus doesn't mean that other people can't hang out. There's also standing room only in the throne room. Persephone's almost always in the throne room when she's home visiting her mother. Eros hangs out in the throne room. The Romans called him Cupid. Eros is the son of Aphrodite. You know who Cupid is. Heracles, Hercules, the, uh, I misspelled that. The Romans called him Hercules. The Greeks called him Heracles. The Romans called him Hercules. Hangs out in the throne room. And Tantalus. Tantalus hangs out in the throne room quite often. You'll be finding out who he is pretty quickly. And occasionally lots of other gods and people and so on drop by to visit. Uh, it's a pretty, pretty busy place. 